Hey mamas, good morning. I hope you're doing good. So thanks for all the moms who registered today for the breastfeeding class. I thought it would be easiest to do it via Instagram Live so we can have you know more mamas accessing it. And I just hope you're having a great day. If you can, go get a cup of tea or some coffee. Cause you know, as mamas, it's hard to have a moment to yourself with some hot coffee. You might even have baby in your hands and that's fine. So we have a lot of moms signed up that are expecting, but also ones who have newborns and they're just struggling a little bit. So I am not only a nurse, but an IBCLC, which is an international board certified lactation consultant. And I just want to do everything I can to give you information that's helpful, that can make the process of you know motherhood a little bit easier. And a big part of that is feeding our babies. So I have a couple things to review. I'm gonna be looking at my notes. As we all know, pregnancy and early motherhood, we have mom brain, right? So if you're you know, feeling that, give me a high five. <laughs> it lasts for a long time, you guys, as proof. Jane is three and a half and um, it gets better, but the coffee helps, right? So first off, I'm gonna be going through some announcements before we get started, but I'm so excited you all are here. If you could please, you know, put something in the chat box, just how are you feeling? Two words, how are you feeling today? And then for announcements, I have two things I wanna cover with you guys. First off, I'm the founder of Unique Footprints. So, you know, a little bit of my background, but I am a neonatal nurse. I went to deliveries, assisted with neonatal resuscitation, also helped in the newborn nursery and postpartum to help my mamas. And through that transition, I just felt like, oh my gosh, there's so much more we can do to help support moms during this phase of motherhood. And then I got pregnant, had a baby, and even with everything I knew, I just felt overwhelmed. And so you're not alone. I'm here to help you from one mom to another who's been there. We can get through this together. And so I want you to know that this is a safe space free of judgment. So if you have any questions, you can add it to this chat box. You can DM me directly if it's personal because so much of this is individualized or you can always email me at Jenny at uniquefootprints.com. So what is Unique Footprints, you guys? Unique Footprints is a complete passion project. So I was able to resign last year from the hospital and focus on Unique Footprints full time. So just know if you need additional support, we have online programs from pregnancy all the way from early motherhood to three years postnatally. And we focus on baby, preparing families for baby, but also preparing the mother and the dad and the whole unit because it's so much more than a birth, it's a lifetime, right? And so I want y'all to know that at any time you can go check out uniquefootprints.com to get more information. We are so excited. We are having a photo shoot next month, October 13th. So if you are local and you have a new baby that's in between three months to about six months, we would absolutely love for you to join in. It is going to be in Flower Mound, Texas on October 13th from 10 a.m. to noon. So you and your spouse and baby can all come and we're going to be giving out miracle milk cookies so that will help boost your supply and then you'll get all the pictures in exchange. Just heads up we are using those pictures for the website and some other marketing collateral. So it just kind of depends on if you feel comfortable with that. Some moms are going to be breastfeeding while other moms are just going to be doing newborn care or just holding baby. So just know we have a couple spots left for that. We actually have two spots left. If you're interested in a photo shoot and you're local and you want some pictures of your baby with your spouse, or if you're just alone, just know we're going to have cookies available for you and it's going to be October 13th. So DM me or email me. So let's see. A lot of us are feeling tired today. It's Monday. Mondays are always brutal, right? And so that's normal. And if you're expecting or if you're a new mom, it's we're tired, right? And so having a community where we can support each other and just say it's okay to be tired, it's, a, it's gonna be okay. But get your coffee. I am a proponent of breastfeeding and coffee or tea. So if you ever have questions on, okay, well, how can I breastfeed and drink some coffee? I'm here to answer them. But one tip you guys is you start at the beginning of a feed so if you're having your cup of coffee um you just brew it up get it ready and then while you're breastfeeding baby 
you drink your coffee, okay? And what that does is it doesn't go straight into your bloodstream, straight into your breasts and to baby, and it gives you a couple hours to metabolize it out of your system. However, you do want to be mindful of how much coffee in different places like Starbucks is higher amount right of caffeine and so i'm doing a stories q a today so check it out and i'll have the exact milligrams of what to look out for i believe it's 300 milligrams or under but i'll double check and put that in stories okay you guys so let's get started so let's see i went over our announcements a little introduction so let's go over what to expect because I feel like families, especially day two in the hospital, that's the day that they're in tears and they're just like, I wish someone had prepared me for this. And so let's go over just the first 10 days, kind of what to expect so that we can make more informed decisions knowing what's to come. So you have this idea about how you want your birth to go, right? And then we get into labor and delivery or we labor for days and it looks a little bit different than planned. So now you're gonna be really tired, right? And things do depend on your delivery. If you did unmedicated medicaid or ended up having a cesarean, that does absolutely affect your postpartum recovery. So keep that in mind. But all moms are gonna be tired, right? And so is baby. And so the first 24 hours, our mamas are always asking, why is baby so sleepy? Well, think about it, you guys. Y'all labored, it wasn't just you, it was your baby too. And baby is tired just like you so just remember day one first 24 hours from birth till the next day is a sleepy phase so baby's going to be super sleepy that doesn't mean we don't feed baby we absolutely feed baby but you do lots of skin to skin put baby on skin to skin with a diaper i have a lot of families who are like skin to skin with no diaper and i'm like well only if you want to get peed and pooped on so definitely keep that diaper on do skin to skin Baby's going to smell the milk and, you know, go ahead and feed. But if baby is still sleepy at that, you know, three hour mark or so, go ahead and offer it. Okay. We want to at least offer. Some babies will take milk. Sometimes they won't. What is so amazing, you guys, is after delivery, babies actually will be delivered and they'll sit on your stomach and they will crawl up to you and they will initiate the first feeding. And that's called baby led feeding where you're just laid back. It is going to blow your mind. It just shows you how amazing we are as humanity and how we're able to survive. It is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen because we don't have to show baby what to do. They, Their instincts know what to do. And so they can smell the milk. Your areola is larger at this point. It's kind of like a bullseye. It helps baby know where to go. And so just remember at the beginning, your baby's gonna know what to do. Sometimes we do need to help out a little bit especially with our mamas who have medicated births or if you had a cesarean delivery. So keep that in mind. Babies who are unmedicated, coming from unmedicated deliveries are gonna have a little bit easier time with breastfeeding. They're gonna be more alert and they're just gonna know that those cues and that instinct kind of kicks in a little bit quicker. The other ones are gonna be a little bit more sleepy. And so that's okay. Remember the first 24 hours they are sleepy, but just remember about every three hours or so, you do want to attempt to feed. And remember they have reserves from their umbilical cord, they're gonna be fine, okay? So day two and three, do you know what this is? So this is different than day one, and this is when the families are a little bit emotional, which is normal, like you've been through a lot. So day two and three, we call it breastfeeding buffet. And you know why? Because baby is awake, they're alert, and they are hungry, and they are going through a little mini growth spurt. So we call it cluster feeding, where they are constantly feeding. And so most babies feed about eight to 12 times a day, sometimes more, especially during day two and three, when they're clustering. This is normal, you guys. So if you can go in saying, okay, day one is gonna be our recovery day, we're gonna be super sleepy, we're still gonna you know, get baby fed, but day two and three is gonna be quite different. I think mentally you can go in with a different perspective knowing what's ahead. It is so overwhelming for a new family who isn't prepared for this reality. And so they thought, okay, day two and three is gonna be similar to day one. We're gonna sleep like we did on day one and it's not the case. And by day two evening is when most families decide to get formula. And so if you know the stats, about 80% of families, moms attempt breastfeeding, which is amazing, that is huge. But about one third actually go through the duration of a year. So 
just knowing that day two is tough and then knowing your options. So if we get formula, it does affect our supply and we'll go into that later, but just knowing, okay, if day two is going to be kind of hard, what am I going to do to prepare my body, my mind, you know, for that. And a lot is going to be support from your spouse and just really knowing, right? So what is it? 80% is mental and 20% is physical. So just hang in there, mama. Also utilize your IBCLCs, your lactation consultants, if it's through you know, your midwifery care with your doulas or at the hospital, we are all here to help you and support you. And we're gonna get you through day two and three. And then you go home and here, let me see. Okay, day two and three was hard for me. It is knowing that it was normal and would pass soon was what I had to hold on to to keep going. Yes, Emily, I have goosebumps because it's so true. It's just knowing that it will pass, it will get easier, and it's gonna be okay. But those are gonna be the hardest days. So if you go in knowing that, it's gonna get easier, okay? And then from there, you kind of get into a little routine. You're at home and you know your milk has come in, which takes about two to three days on average, a little bit longer for our C-section mamas, and I'll go into that in a little bit. But yeah, you get into this routine and you know baby a little bit more and you're figuring this out and then day 10. Does anybody know what happens around day 10? So this is whenever I get the call at the hospital like I don't have any milk, something is going on, my baby is crying all the time, feeding all the time. Well, remember day two and three was our cluster feeding days, our little mini growth spurt for our baby. Now day 10 around about is another growth spurt. So let's go into growth spurts because I feel like that is another concern for our families is, okay, what is a growth spurt? What is the purpose and why and when does it happen? Okay, so I'm all about preparing you for the unexpected here and this will help make life so much easier for you. So day two and three, the cluster feeding is helping. It's all about supply and demand, right? The more you feed, the more milk you have. Well, about day 10 to 12 is when you hit your first growth spurt. And growth spurts have a purpose, right? It is helping your milk. It's increasing it. It's giving baby what they need in that moment to grow. And what is so amazing about a growth spurt, even though it is so freaking hard in the moment, is baby substantially grows after. So a growth spurt can last anywhere from a day to 10 days, 10 being very, very long and not the norm. On average, it's about three. Jane did a 10 day growth spurt. I was dying, but it, it happened and I've never seen it ever. <laughs> but so I have to just let you know it's possible. Things are possible that we don't even even realize that it's possible, right? I was kind of shocked. So I wanna, you know, give you a heads up there, but that's not normal. So just know that growth spurts do have a purpose and it boosts your supply and it gives baby what they need to substantially grow, which is really, really important. And so growth spurts hit on the three. So remember day two to three, about day 10 of life, and then on the three. So three weeks, six weeks, 12 weeks. So that's three months, six months, nine months, 12 months, a year, a year and a half, two years. So it, it doesn't always hit on those days, but let's say it's a week before that time or a couple days after, and you start seeing this type of behavior of cluster feeding around the clock, just know that that is most likely a growth spurt. However, if you have concerns, if this is something that continues, that doesn't stop, you definitely wanna meet up with your pediatrician IBCLC to check your latch because we just wanna make sure, you know, it's not a shallow latch and baby's not transferring. But if baby is transferring, has good output, and, you know, gaining weight, it's typically a growth spurt. So just keep that in mind. And then let's see what else. That's what to expect for the first 10 days of life and then as it, you know, as it relates to growth spurts. Let's go over feeding cues. Do y'all know any feeding cues that are typical that you see with your baby or that you've heard of? So one tip is just that with feeding cues, you wanna get in, you know, get baby early if possible. A crying baby is usually a late sign that they're hungry and it's gonna happen, it happens to all of us. But just remember a crying baby has a very aggressive suck, which more so leads to nipple irritation and trauma, right? So keep that in mind if baby is crying, you're like, oh my goodness, I, I'm kinda late to the feed. 
do whatever you can to calm baby and you know soothing techniques and you can learn more in unique footprints but typically you want to make sure the diaper is changed they're clean you want to you could always try and swaddle but if you're about to breastfeed i typically recommend putting baby skin to skin right so take them out of the swaddle change the diaper put them on skin to skin and if they're still ballistic so this is amazing this is from a pediatrician you can have daddy help you with this while you're kind of getting all your stuff ready you take their arms and you crisscross it against them. And this is in the Unique Footprints program too, to make it really easy. And you just put your little hand underneath the bottom and you go like this, always of course holding their neck. But it simulates in utero, you guys, it's amazing. I would do it in all the perinatal education classes that I taught at the hospital. And some of them would bring their newborns in. And they were like, what the heck? If only I knew that this could calm down my baby. So there are some tips and tricks, but just try and calm baby down if you can before putting them on your nipple. If not, it's okay, but just try. It's really gonna help you, okay? So early cues. Okay, early cues are gonna be baby licking their lips, smacking a little bit. If you touch their face, it's called rooting where they go towards it. If you start noticing those signs or even baby putting their hand to their mouth, Go ahead, get your water, get your snack, go to your little breastfeeding area, wherever you breastfeed in the house, and go ahead and get started, okay? And so those are gonna be super helpful to help your nipples because the next thing we're gonna cover is positioning and nipple care. Okay, so positioning. So think through on positioning how you would hold your baby, especially for all our expecting mamas and even some of our new mamas. So a lot of moms, about 90%, try and hold their baby a certain way because that's what we see in the media. So what I mean by that is every time I taught classes in person, I'd say, show me how you're going to feed baby. And what do they do? Cradle hold, right? Which is normal. This is what we see in the media. And so I get that. But this, the cradle hold, is gonna be more beneficial once baby has neck control and you've got breastfeeding established and you know how to get baby on and off the breast in a way that's not gonna hurt you and is best for baby to transfer milk and all the things. So keep in mind, this is a great go-to for later, not for the newborn phase if possible. We already talked about baby laid back feeding. We're at delivery, baby will actually come up on you. You're more in a reclined position and then they just find your breast and your nipple and they latch on naturally. It is amazing. So try it and report back and let me know how that goes. So let's say day two and three, you're struggling, baby's cluster feeding. You tried the cross cradle, which we're going to go over the football hold and it's not working. Then go back to the first feeding position. It tends to help significantly because it takes away all the pressure of us just trying to get baby on and just let them naturally find your breast. Let them eat. You can even do some hand expression, pull some milk out, put it on their mouth and that will significantly help. I'll cover hand expression in a minute too. But let's go over cross cradle. Cross cradle is one of my favorite holds, especially on day two and three, where you just hold baby across their back. You use your hand to hold their neck. So in one hand, essentially one arm, you're holding your baby. The other hand is gonna be available for your breast because our goal is to support baby but also help guide our breasts into their mouth in a certain way that helps with a deeper latch and milk transfer. I see a lot of babies who will get onto just the tip of the nipple and that's really tough right? Tough for mom, tough for baby. It's tough because it causes nipple trauma, but it also is such a shallow latch that baby doesn't transfer. So if baby's not transferring, you're working so hard as a mom trying to breastfeed, but then baby's not getting much milk. So it's not helping any of y'all, right? Baby's failure to thrive. Mom is in a lot of pain. So let's go over the cross cradle hold to help decrease this. And for any hold you do, you always wanna do nose to nipple. And I know that concept seems crazy, but let me show you. Nose to nipple. If you line up baby's mouth, or baby's nose, sorry, baby's nose to your nipple, like this, if you can see, it's kinda hard. Do nose to nipple. When baby opens, the nipple goes to the roof of the mouth, the palate. To stimulate any suck, you want to touch the palate right? And then they have a deeper latch and they can transfer so much milk. I see a lot of families who the baby will be over the breast and the nipple is in line, or I'm sorry, the, the mouth 
nipple mouth. Yeah. And switched up between nose and nipple. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so then the nipple is right in the center of the mouth, right? And the mom's like, that, ah, that's where I'm going to put it. Well, what happens is when the nipple's right here, baby goes up and over and then the gums kind of clench it. It's no fun. So just remember nose to nipple, baby's nose to your nipple. And then they open and then the nipple goes to the roof of the palate. Okay. So with cross cradle hold, you hold the back, you hold your hand on the neck, you take your other hand that's free and you'll hold your breast tissue doing nose to nipple and then guiding it into baby's mouth. If it's ever a shallow latch or it's super painful, use your pinky, put it in the side of baby's mouth, break the suction and try again. If you just pull baby off, it'll be super painful, cause nipple trauma. Uh, but if you keep baby there, baby's probably not gonna be transferring much milk and urine pain anyways. So just start over, it's okay. So no snipple and then go ahead and put, you know, baby will latch on once they open wide. For those babies who just aren't opening wide, you wait. Okay, and there's some things you can do. You can do a lot of babies sometimes come out with some tight, you know, a tight jaw. You can do some massaging on the face right here at the jawline. That helps tremendously, okay? There's other types of work you can do for babies that don't open like cranial sacral therapy and stuff like that. I can give you guys referrals. But remember, cross cradle is a great one. Another one that's really good is football hold, especially for our mamas who have C-sections who just don't want a lot of pressure on that incision site but let's go over how to do it correctly. So in the hospital, I'll see most families with two pillows which line up underneath the bra strap line. And then I'll see baby, I'm gonna get up on my knees so you can see, like this underneath. So if you have large breasts, your breast is sitting on baby and then you're doing this. We don't want that, okay? You have to think that your breasts are gonna weigh so much, it's like a weighted blanket, okay? And if your breast is sitting on baby, they're not gonna get as much milk. They're gonna fall asleep quicker. So what you're gonna wanna do is get two pillows, three typically, sorry, two to three, depending on how high, and you want it to be high. And then you wanna put baby where they actually wrap around you, okay? They're not under you, they're around you, okay? And then you're gonna do the same concept where you do nose to nipple. So you'll hold baby across, they're around you, and then you do nose to nipple, there you go, okay? And a lot of our mamas love cross cradle, football hold too. And then cradle, of course, can come later, okay? Or let's say, hey, you are an experienced mama, you know what you're doing, you could try cross cradle first, get baby on. Once baby's on for the first couple minutes, you know baby's on deep and transferring milk. Now you can just go like this, okay? So you still can cradle, but just in a different way, if possible, right, you guys? This is gonna help. But if baby, you know, slips, then take your pinky, take baby off, okay? So those are gonna be the favorite ones for when you get home about three to five days after you deliver because you are gonna be pretty tender. The sideline is amazing. That was my go-to with Jane. And sideline is just you laying in bed and baby right next to you, okay? Literally that easy. So you are lying on your side and baby is just like this right next to you, okay? Let's go over nipple care. Okay, nipple care is a big one. So the main thing with your supply and your nipples is that the more frequent you feed, the more milk you will make, right? But it's also about the transfer of milk and how much milk you remove. So if a baby is on very shallow, you're not gonna make as much milk and your nipples are gonna be very sore. So you can go anywhere from bruising to blisters to abrasions, okay? So let's just go over, this is a nipple protocol that I use on all the Unique Footprints mamas and all the mamas I use, you know, worked with in the hospital. And one of the moms even said, oh my God, this is like heaven to my nipples. <laughs> I was like, good, that's what I wanna hear. And it was just a couple little tweaks from a shallow latch cradle hold to, oh my gosh, now my milk, you know, is coming in a lot better, baby's transferring milk, more peas and poops, all the things. So it just, it made her feel so much better, more comfortable, and um, baby, you know, is still breastfeeding. So super excited about that. 
nipple care. Before you um, work on nipple care, always remember you start with latch. So you get someone, an IBCLC, your pediatrician, to look at the latch to make sure you're doing everything correctly. If you know you have some tweaks, you can work on that. But let's say, okay, I'm, I'm pretty sore. What can I do? So you always wash your hands, soap and water. Remember 21 seconds, you guys, ABCs. I do that with Jane. And then you know that you're getting a lot of, you know, all the dirt and the bacteria off. So 21 seconds is ideal. And then you can start, you know, working on your nipples. So if you don't already have these, which nobody does, because no one really knows about this, is sterile saline wipes. And I'll put this in the stories. Amazing. I also have a saline recipe that I'll share in stories too, that I usually give to all of the Unique Footprints Mamas in the program. But these you can get on Amazon. It's just sterile saline wipes. So this is essentially the protocol. And um, I'll just show you, I'll open it up just to show you. So it's a saline wipe, okay? So this is mom who has bleeding, abrasions, or blisters, okay? You would just take these saline wipes out and they're very soaked. See how soaked it is? So you're not gonna wanna do that. I'm just showing you. <laughs> you want to keep it as soaked as possible and then you're going to take one for each side don't even open it and you're just going to apply it straight on the nipple okay you're going to leave it there for about 10 to 15 minutes while you're waiting you can put a breast pad over just so that you don't have to hold it the whole time that's not easy but 10 to 15 minutes and then after that you're going to get your nipple cream I love, this is a sample from Mother Love Nipple Cream. I love the organic, all natural nipple creams. I never use the lanolin because I saw so many adverse reactions in the hospital from it. Lanolin is derived from wool, wool sheep, sweat, right? Sheep, sheep sweat is in lanolin. So if you are allergic to dander or wool, it can cause a very bad reaction on your nipples. And so just stay away from it, okay? Go with natural nipple cream. And the tip for nipple cream, you guys, is you only use a teeny tiny amount and you only put it on the nipple. You can put it on the base of the nipple, but not the areola, okay? I see a lot of families that like lather it on. One, it feels good, I love that. But don't do that because what happens? This is like coconut oil, right? This has, yeah, extra virgin olive oil, beeswax, shea butter, like all the things that are super calming and soothing, but also super slippery. So if you lather this all over, not only your nipple, but your areola, what happens is baby slips to the tip of your nipple, causing more nipple trauma, not trans transferring as much milk. Now you have a huge dip in your supply because you're just trying to take care of your nipples. So all you gotta remember is you take your, sol your saline soak, put it on 10 to 15 minutes, you get your nipple cream, only a teeny tiny amount goes a long way and only on the nipple and you're done. Okay, that's it. Within 24 hours, usually within three to six hours you feel better, but 24 hours they should be almost completely healed. Amazing. For our mamas who have um, bruising, Huge proponent of hydrogel pads. Love, love, love. Those were my go-to for self-care. If you can only do one or two things a day for yourself, shower and put on hydrogel pads. <laughs> that was my go-to. So hydrogel pads are amazing. There's different brands out there. I'm not sponsoring anything, nothing sponsored in this. I'm just giving you honest advice. I really liked hydrogel pads. The only thing with that, that's gonna be for bruising. And I know on the packaging it says it can also help with wound care but I want you to be really careful. If you have an abrasion or a blister, don't use the hydrogel pad. Only use the saline and the nipple cream. If you have just some tenderness and some bruising, do the hydrogel pads. So the thing with the hydrogel pads that I saw, even though it's not reported and there's not a lot of information out there, is moms who were only using the hydrogel pads who had the abrasions and the blisters we're coming back with mastitis. And so I have a theory that with the hydrogel pads, it's trapping in bacteria leading to mastitis. So they are wonderful for if you're bruised and tender. Amazing, I mean, they're like heaven, just like this mom said. But if you have abrasions or blisters, I want you to stay away from them, okay? Just because of all the cases I saw in the hospital of mastitis. So those are my two go-to. If your nipples are still severely you know, damaged and traumatized by it, um, 
I want you to follow up with your pediatrician, IBCLC. If these don't work for you within 24 hours, you need a consult. And there's really other things you can do. Like I wrote it down, all purpose nipple ointment was a, a lot, like one that we would prescribe. So you wanna contact your pediatrician, IBCLC. Remember, you don't wait. Um, within six hours, you should feel better. 24 hours, it should be a huge difference. If not, you wanna to talk to your doctor, your P, or not your pediatrician, your OBGYN and your IBCLC. Okay, so let's see. Let's go over the number one question I get asked. Can you think about what it is? Number one, you guys, I'm talking about every family asks this question. How can I tell if my baby's getting enough to eat? It's hard for a breastfeeding mama who, especially type A, <laughs> which I'm that way too, so I get it. Um, to breastfeed your baby and not know if baby is getting enough. So let's go over that so you don't have to worry, okay? So it's different, of course, with pumping, you see how much milk, or with formula feeding or donor milk feeding, right? With a bottle, you know exactly how much baby is getting. With the breast, you don't. So let's go over some ways to tell if baby is getting enough. The number one is gonna be their output, how many peas and poops they have. So, yes! <laughs> Sorry, mama bear, yes, is baby getting enough? That is the question, right? So, peas and poops, output, always. So, this is just a guide. Remember, everything is very individualized, so keep this in mind. So, the first 24 hours, our goal is one pee, one poop. That is for a whole 24 hours after delivery. So, you deliver your baby, that is the birth time. We have 24 hours to meet that goal. This is just a goal. Everything is individualized, things change. Sometimes you'll have a day where they have a lot more, another that they have lower. That's okay. Just keep this in mind. This will help ease your anxiety, knowing, okay, is baby getting enough? Day two, 24 hours, is two peas, two poops. Day three, three and three. Four is four and four. Day five, it's about five peas, five poops. It doesn't keep going up like crazy. It'll steady out. But this is a good indicator to know, okay, well, it's day five, we're home, we're breastfeeding around the clock, but my baby has only peed once and hasn't pooped in like 48 hours. So, okay, there is a decrease in output there. It's okay. You want to call the pediatrician and then while you're there, do an IBCLC consult. Just see, is there something we can tweak? What else do we need to be doing? You also want a baby that is alert and awake. If your baby is ever lethargic, not waking up for feeds, and I'm talking about something significantly different than our day one, day two, is just you wanna get that checked out. If your baby is lethargic and not waking up for feeds at all, we wanna look at jaundice levels, which can significantly affect feedings, but we also wanna see, okay, is baby in enough, okay? So keep that in mind. Peas and poops, number one. That's a really easy way to tell that will help decrease your anxiety. Number two is their weight. So all babies lose weight at first and all families freak out because they don't know this. So just go in knowing, okay, my baby is gonna lose weight. This is very common, all babies lose weight. Our goal is for them to get back to their birth weight by about two weeks, okay? So they have plenty of time. Think about they had all this, you know, all the food and everything given to you through the umbilical cord, they have reserves. When they come out, they're gonna be pooping a lot, peeing a lot. A lot of that's also gonna be fluid from your IVs. If you go to the hospital, you have to keep that in mind. So they might have like high amounts of output, high amounts of weight loss, it's gonna be okay. Typical weight loss is about 7%. Sometimes it goes up to 12, 14% for C-sections. Just remember, talk to your pediatrician, see what they feel like is the realm of normal versus not, and just, it's gonna be okay. They're gonna, they're gonna get their weight back. If they lose on the higher end of the weight, then just know it's gonna take them a little bit longer, okay? So another one is weighted feeds. So at your follow-up appointment with your pediatrician, you can schedule an IBCLC consult. And I love this, and we did this all the time where we would do our pre and post weight check. By then, your milk has come in. You can really assess how is baby doing, how is latch going, how is feedings going, are they sleeping? How you know how are how are y'all doing all together? It's not just about baby; it's about you too. But we do a pre and post weight check, so we're able to see okay how much is baby transferring. And remember, every feeding is going to be different. 
So in the Unique Footprints program, we have a whole section dedicated to this with a newborn weight tool. So depending on if they're 24 hours postpartum or they're a month postpartum, what's so neat is you can actually put in all their information and then you can do a trending weight, which I teach you how to do. So a trending weight is because you don't want to drive yourself crazy doing weight checks every feeding, right? If you have a baby scale at home and you're a type A and you really, really want to know how much baby is getting is you can do a training weight where you do the first morning feed, right? And then you just look at that over a span of a couple days to a week. Most moms I say, don't even worry about that. I just want you focusing on baby and feeding and if baby's transferring and you're feeling okay, we're good, but it's those mamas who are a little bit more type A that want to know exactly how much baby's getting for peace of mind to decrease their anxiety, then we have a tool for that too. We want you to know no matter how you're feeling, if you're a little bit more laid back or you're a little bit more like, I really, really need to know, we're gonna help support you through that. So know that those are some options, okay? Let's go over some signs of milk transfer. Do y'all know anything? Do y'all know some signs of milk transfer? I know we talked about the peas and the poops, which is huge. The gaining the weight, especially like getting up to that birth, back to that birth weight. So in Unique Footprints, we have a whole section dedicated to this. So I printed it out just so I cannot forget anything for you. So let's see. Okay, so signs of milk transfer can be sustained sucking. Heads up on that. So babies suck, suck, suck fast then they slow down, they stop, and then they have like gulps, and then they'll pause. Suck, 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 pause, gulp, 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 pause. So you might see a baby pause for a while, and then they go back at it. It doesn't mean they stopped, that's just how they feed. They're learning how to breathe, suck, swallow all in one, and so keep that in mind. So whenever you give a bottle and they're gulp, 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 they're literally, it's not because they're starving, they're gulping like that, they, they literally can't breathe, okay? So you wanna give them breaks and we teach you pace bottle feeding in the program, but this is all about breastfeeding, so let's stay focused on that. Just remember they take breaks. Uh, audible swallowing, you'll actually start hearing it and once your milk comes in, you'll see letdowns, it's amazing. You'll see them gulping, it's the coolest thing ever. When they started feeding, they're super tense usually, and then as they get full, their hands will open, and then they'll just be calm, just like you would be after you have a big meal. And then mouth is moist, and they're satisfied after feedings. If their lips are super chapped, their tongue looks very dry, you wanna get that checked out, okay? Also, the sunken fontanelle, you wanna make sure baby's getting enough, okay? Those are some red flags. So let's see, the, for mama, you can have uterine contractions for the first three to five days. If you have pain medication or you had a C-section, try and take that medicine before you breastfeed because it's a good thing, right? Your uterus is the size of a pear and it grows the size of a watermelon to hold baby. You deliver baby. So once you deliver baby and you're breastfeeding, it actually releases those hormones to help it contract which is such a good thing to help it go back to the size it was. It, it helps decrease your risk for hemorrhage, but it is quite painful and it will push out that old blood. So just remember when you're breastfeeding, you're gonna feel those uterine contractions if baby is actually transferring milk and you're gonna have an increase of um, bleeding during that time, okay? So keep that in mind. You are also gonna be very relaxed and very drowsy. So a lot of times I'd be in a console and the mom would be falling asleep on me. <laughs> and I was just like, just go for it. I'm right here watching baby just sleep, okay? It's okay. She's like, I don't know why I'm so tired. <laughs> and it's like, you just went through so much and now your body is releasing all of these hormones that help you relax and sleep. And then that's gonna give all that to baby. So. Yes, it has a purpose. So just know that those are some signs of milk transfer to help, you know, ease your anxiety and your fears if, if baby's getting enough or not, okay? So the acceptable weight gain for baby, typically, because we went over, they're all gonna lose weight, is just remember it's gonna be different for a breastfeeding baby compared to a formula feeding baby. So babies on average are gonna be gaining about four to seven ounces a week, okay? So if you're doing those trending weights, just remember, that's why you trend it and you look at a week's time, okay? And then let's go over one thing that I love. 
the bellies. Do y'all know anything about the baby belly sizes? So this would shock the families in the hospital. They're like, what? My baby's stomach is so tiny, but it grows so fast. Yes, and so that's why we say, like, it's okay. The first 24 to 48 hours, I mean, it's colostrum, right? It's super rich, the first milk. Um, but they're not getting that much. But you have to think their tummy is so tiny. So, of course, they're going to be eating frequently, right? And every meal is going to be different. Sometimes they're going to want to go in for Thanksgiving. And sometimes they just want to snack, just like you do. So, it's not like with formula, getting the same thing day in and day out, the same amount. They actually regulate it, which is amazing and so good for them long term it decreases risk for you know just diabetes and um, obesity because they know how to regulate their intake but a note about diabetes and obesity we see a lot of families on day two give formula because that's going to be the hardest day but they're giving this much so the first day you guys they're only taking in like a teaspoon per feeding right so it says five to seven milliliters per feeding the first day by the third day your milk is starting to come in right they're taking about 30 milliliters it says 23 to 38 on average it's like 30 and then by a week seven days they're taking about 60 to 75 milliliter which is the standard whole bottle like you would see with Similac or something but what we see is a lot of females like oh my gosh my baby's so hungry it's day one I'm gonna give a bottle but then they give the amount for a stomach at a week so now it's made things kind of difficult it's made things difficult in that mom who wants to breastfeed is more frustrated because the baby doesn't seem satisfied after feedings because he's wanting the amount that you gave for every bottle feeding. Plus, what it does is it, you guys, it increases risk for obesity and diabetes because it stretched out that little tummy. And there's so many other things I can think of. Um, they're they're gulping because they're not breathing and so if we learn pace bottle feeding and we do you know give formula or donor milk that's okay but we want to give it for the amount that they would actually be taking not this double triple amount because that's going to lead to unfavorable outcomes for the whole family okay so keep that in mind depending on how old baby is you really want to feed the amount of their stomach per feeding okay and then let's go over some questions. I had some moms send me some questions. I want you to start typing anything you can think of. If I can't get to you, you are important to me and I'm gonna do a whole Q&A from y'all's questions and the other questions I got through the community on stories today. So you can make sure you get everything answered. So one is, oh my God, I have engorgement help. Okay, <laughs> so this is a big one, but I'm gonna make it super quick. So I treat engorgement a little bit differently than the normal recommendations just because I've seen how much it helps the mamas that I've worked with. So this is my recommendation for engorgement. My recommendation for engorgement is, okay, <laughs> it is a big one and it's so individualized to you guys. So if baby's able to latch on, get them on, okay? And then massage while you're feeding. Okay, you can also do some hand expression where you go back and forward. Hand expression is a big topic and very important. And so with hand expression, you literally just go back towards the rib cage and hold down the milk duct. I see a lot of moms actually like stretching out the skin. That's not gonna help anything. That's not gonna move the milk. So you wanna go straight back, hold it down, hold it down, and then that will help the milk come out which is an amazing tool for when baby is sleepy. You can put some on their mouth and then kind of get them, you know, interested in feeding them and put them on. It's also really good for mamas who are separated from baby. We want you feeding or pumping within an hour. And so if you're not able to, you can do some hand expression. And then with engorgement. So with engorgement, you can always hand express and save it to help release some of that tension to get baby on. If baby's not latching, you can also pump for about five minutes. The thing with pumping is the more we remove, the more we make. So if you pump to release some of that discomfort, it's absolutely okay, but you, you pump to comfort, not to soft. If we pump to soft, then whoo, it just keeps coming in. So you pump to comfort, it's a thing called down regulation, right? So if we're not removing so much, we're not making so much, right? So we wanna do both. Uh, you don't wanna stop feeding your baby. That's the last thing you wanna do. You wanna make sure you continue to feed your baby, continue to remove the milk, 
instead of applying heat, I want you to stay away from the heat because heat makes so much more milk come in and every lactation person will probably tell you something different. This is just what I've done with thousands of moms and it's really worked is we do either the pumping before the hand expression before we put baby on and after the feeding, we do cold compresses for about 10 to 15 minutes, no longer than that. And then we just keep on doing that. If she's so engorged, she's hurting, we do some hand expression, okay? You can do massaging, hand expression, that's significantly gonna help. There is more information on engorgement and I can send you a link to that if you would like that. But I just want you to know those are kind of the tips that I follow and I've seen really, really, really good outcomes with that. With cabbage, cabbage, um, I haven't ever done cabbage on my mamas because there is a risk for decreasing your supply. However, a lot of moms use it and it is beneficial for third spacing with all of the fluid. So know that if you want to do that, that is an option, but you do not want to use cabbage for that long. You want to freeze it after you've cooked it. The only reason it's going to work is if it's been cooked. Freeze it and then put it on for about 15 minutes and that's it. That's not my recommendation, but I am giving you some info because every mom asks about cabbage. I want you to know how to do it correctly. Okay, is there a delay in milk production with a C-section? So because everything is individualized, you guys, what happened for one mom might not happen for another, okay? So what I have seen is a yes. So on average, about 80% of the moms that I've cared for who have had C-sections did have a delay. It doesn't mean that they weren't able to exclusively breastfeed. I had a C-section, I labored for four days, I had an OP baby and I had an emergency C-section. So with that being said, we were able to still successfully breastfeed and she didn't get any formula and that was just because that's what I wanted. So keep in mind with C-sections is that you still have the delivery of your placenta that kicks in all those hormones to breastfeed. But then we have to start removing the milk. So that's either through breastfeeding or pumping if you're separated from, from baby to get everything to continue to come in. You have to think about some moms had a lot of blood loss. Some moms are in severe pain, even though it's controlled. Your body just went through a major surgery. So typically it takes about two to three days to get your milk to transition in. With C-section, sometimes it's not on the second day, but the third. It's gonna be okay. Or sometimes it's the fourth. You still have milk. Usually they still have a plenty amount to give to baby. If they had a big hemorrhage, then we set up what's called triple feedings, where mom feeds and then we pump to stimulate and then we save that or give that to baby right after. We don't ever save it for long term, but we could save it for the next feeding. So know that you have options, but just go in knowing, okay, if I have a C-section, it might be a little bit longer. So you just wanna keep up the frequent feedings. You wanna decrease your stress. You wanna rest. You wanna get back to your basics. You wanna stay hydrated and do what you can to support the healing process. One note on C-section mamas. Day two is when your pain medicine wears off. Stay ahead of the pain. Okay, seriously stay ahead of the pain. Okay, how many feeds do babies take on day one on an average? So if they're already touched upon pregnancy brain. Oh, no, I completely get it, Mama Bear. So every baby from the start typically takes about eight to 12 feedings a day. So if you think about every three hours, that's eight feedings, but this day two and three are probably taking about 12, you know, 14. So day one, we still want to recommend, you know, waking up baby to feed every three or so hours or at least like attempting and maybe they don't feed every three hours. That's okay. Maybe you get six feedings in or four feedings in instead of the eight. For the first day, it's going to be okay. They have reserves. You can do some hand expression, give them some milk that way that's gonna help significantly. Especially remembering that the first day they're only taking in like a teaspoon every feeding whenever we get them to feed. So just hang in there. Just the biggest thing is if you have a super sleepy baby because you had a C-section or you had lots of pain medicine, you have to just remember that could, we don't want it to affect, affect your milk supply, right? So we gotta remove that milk. So if baby's really not waking up, we're gonna do that hand expression, we're gonna feed it to them. At that point, they're gonna wake up, usually latch. If they don't, maybe we'll go ahead and set up the pump, but I like to wait at least 24 hours to set up the pump because it's just a lot for a new mom. So I'm usually in there hand expressing with her, we're getting a drop or two, and I'm like, yes! Because um, that's, that's fine, you know? And then let's see what else. 
one thing about the moments who registered, I had y'all do uh, print out this handout. It is so amazing. So when we feed our baby, cause feeding is such a thing. <laughs> it's so important, but it is a concern is what our options. Our options are breast milk, human milk, right? Um, donor milk, formula. So know your options. And so in unique footprints for feedings, you guys, we're all, all, also working with adoption centers is we have breastfeeding classes. We have pumping classes. We have information on milk bank donors and, you know, donor milk and how to get it. Um, as well as bottle feeding, safe infant formula. Cause if you're going to get formula, you want to get the safest brands, right? And, um, baby food basics and allergy prevention methods. So any type of feeding that comes up, I want you to know we're here to support you within the Unique Footprints program. But this was a study done, and I know you cannot read it, but for the moms who signed up, I sent this to you. It shows, just so you can kind of see, what all is in breast milk compared to formula. And it blew my mind when I saw this. I was like, oh my God, I have to put this study, this compilation into a quick handout for our moms. Because it just shows you, like, we're grateful we have access to donor milk and to formula, right? We are grateful we have the tools to feed our child that people didn't have access to. But we also need to see, well, what is the difference? I mean, really, we know the benefits, but what is the difference? So I always tell mamas if breastfeeding is tough, which, oh, yeah, we added hormone therapy for breastfeeding uh, for our adoption mamas. But let's say breastfeeding isn't working, it's okay, but know you have options. You have donor milk. You have the ability to possibly pump. You have the ability to use formula. So you have options, and so I just hope this helps you in some way to prepare for baby or to help you as you transition into motherhood because you don't have to do this alone, and there are so many mamas out there who are trained to help you and so if you have any questions ever, you know you can DM me directly through Unique Footprints RNs. You can email me at Jenny at Unique Footprints RNs, or you can join Unique Footprints, our pregnancy or early motherhood program. We have not only amazing content that's video-based and easy to digest, you get a year access, but we also have a community where you can ask questions to our 21 mom clinicians and we answer them for you because we want you to not get misinformation. We want it to be information that helps bring peace and who wouldn't want that? So without further ado, I just want to say thank you so much for being here with me and it really means a lot. I am an introvert and so I don't do lives and so you just made this a pleasure, and so thank you so much. Have a great day, you guys. Bye.